So let me take uh, this uh, opportunity and honor to introduce our first speaker of uh, the day. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Gardas was born and brought up in Surat, Gujarat. He completed his BSc, MSc and PhD in chemistry from V. Narmal South Gujarat University. And then he joined University of Coimbra, University of Aviero, Portugal and Queen's University, Belfast, UK for his postdoctoral uh, research on physical chemical properties and application of ionic liquids. Then he joined IIT Madras and currently he is full-time professor in uh, IIT Madras. He has more than 20 years of research and 10 years of teaching experience. So far, he has completed eight uh, projects worth more than 6.5 crores and he's guided 11 PhD and 15 MSc project students, co-authored four patents, four book chapters, seven conference papers, and 160 research publications, which received more than 6,000 citations with H index 38 and an average citation per paper of above 35. He has delivered more than 150 invited talks and guest lecture. His uh, research group focuses on chemical thermodynamics and phase equilibria of industrially important solvents and their mixture. His research group is unique in the country and focuses both on science and technology part of contemporary field ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents as alternative to volatile organic solvents. More than 7,500 thermodynamic data points measured in his research lab at IIT Madras are included in NISD standard reference database developed by Thermodynamics Research Center USA. He has developed a model uh, and uh, that explains the density of variety of ionic liquids and it is extensively used by the pure science community as Kardas and Cotino model. In recognition of its outstanding performer as a researcher, he has been bestowed with several awards uh, like Mid Career R&D Award 2020. Uh, recently, he has been recognized as Associate Editor of Halloween Elsewhere Journal. Uh, he is Fellow Royal Society of Chemistry UK, Publon's Top Peer Review Award 2019, which is given to top 1% of reviewers in chemistry. And he is one among the world's top 25 emerging investigators by the Journal of Chemical and Engineering Data and American Chemical Society Journal. So with that note, I take extreme privilege to invite you to deliver your talk, sir. Thank you. Uh, if the volume is okay and the slides are fine. Everything is fine, sir. Please okay. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would like to start thanking uh, Nirma University and Institute of Technology organizers and uh, all the people who involved directly or involved indirectly approving this STTP and conducting STTP, Professor R. N. Patel, Professor S. S. Patel, and uh, uh, the guest uh, Professor Yogesh Trivedi, and the coordinators Dr. Neha Patni and uh, Dr. Amit Amita Chaudhary, and all. It's a great privilege to have you on board around uh, 70 people. And I was told there are students, faculties from across the country are there. So nice. So today I'm going to share my experience uh, on handling some of these instruments and uh, uh, getting data and more than getting data results, but fine tuning and then plotting and then understanding how it is happening. Everything is not in the slides, but I will share when and uh, opportunity comes so it's about uh, my journey started on uh, research of this about 20 years ago from gujarat itself from surat in south gujarat university i was not knowing anything about uh, densitometer i only know density means mass by volume or viscosity means we just uh, see by equal hold or uh, post viscometer and uh, just see from mark a to b how much time it's taking to flow Refractive index means you just put a mirror in the down and refractometer is there and uh, let sunlight comes and see how much, uh, what do you call, snail law we know. But so from there, MSc or a BSc point of view to research point of view, same thing, same thing we do, but we do Jarahat or we care for more accuracy, we care for more purity, we understand the calibration, we understand the 
the principle, we understand their applications and we understand the requirement. That's the only difference. Otherwise, everything people are studying from BSc onwards or at least in MSc, everything is nothing new. So I see the good panel of uh, speakers and everything. And among all spectroscopic and thermal techniques, it's, it's, uh, it's a bridge. All spectral techniques are bridged between two thermal uh, two thermodynamic properties. First is today, and the last one is um, maybe this last one on thermal property. So it's a nice combination, and uh, it's uh, let me go to the next slide and uh, and put me the picture. Yes, please. I'm from chemistry department at IIT Madras. Uh, today's my talk is not only restricted chemistry or chemical engineering or it's a multidisciplinary and mostly the thermodynamic properties and acoustic properties or refractive properties or transport properties these are used by all engineers and all uh, scientists and uh, let's see uh, i would like to thank all my collaborators students and funding agencies and my institute for the support without which not possible to have this many data and we have contributed our bit. So let me begin with uh, one small suggestion to youngster or the contemporary. The future is collaboration. Whatever way you are expert in one field is not enough. We need to understand the same property, the same thing in a different way on a different methods or a different varieties of the techniques to confirm that what we are concluding is correct or close to the reality. So science and engineering should go together. So especially when we see the bulk properties when phase is changing, change in state, whether solid to liquid or liquid to vapor or vapor to solid or vice versa. When the phase change occur, the bulk properties change very often. And this is an advantage or this is an opportunity to understand where phase changes are very minor or where phase change materials are there. For us, ice means a solid. Ice means only one phase. But those people are working specifically on ice. They will tell how many varieties of ice are there. You will be surprised to know four, five, six, seven, eight, or even more than 10 varieties of ices are known. And similarly, when materials are not pure, they are in complex and the compounded form, where a minute phase change is occurring, this helps us to understand various either the reactions or the applications or the properties. And all this can be understood very simple techniques where we measure bulk property. Today, I'm going to talk very simple properties, but very effective and very precise to understand. Some of them you will be surprised to know, for example, in pharmaceutical industry, when you have two isomers, okay, everything is common, structure, elemental analysis, or even molecular weight, everything is same. Only property which can distinguish and which is a good drug or which is not so good drug is a refractive index. One of the best method in pharmaceutical industry, very cheap, but very reliable and very great to understand the right formula of the drug or the right formations of the drug. How precise it is because it's a life and death issue. And that can be done by only through refractive, where many other techniques fail to understand. Okay? That's the inherent properties of the uh, materials. So when we say materials, what we like to understand as an engineer or as a scientist, we need to know the proper structure. We need to understand composition. If, if it is a pure, what kind of elements are involved or if it's a mixture, how much composition of each individual materials are and the property. Properties here I'm talking mostly bulk property. And we need to understand this structure composition properties very well to make better synthesis, to understand better bondings and interactions and their behavior either as a pure or in presence of others. And all these are essential when you go for applications based on this. And to understand applications or to make applications more viable or better, eco-friendly, environmental friendly, user friendly or industry friendly 
or profitable, you need to understand their structure, composition, and properties very well. And in this one, bulk properties play a major role and a crucial. So, why we need to characterize or why we need to understand materials first? If it is a new materials, we need to identify what are they. And this can be also done by instead of other than other characterizations like spectrum techniques, when bulk properties can tell, thermal techniques can tell whether it is a, a same compound or not, whether it is same mixture of compounds or not. And we also find out if you have more than one compound mix, how much quantity each one belongs or composition, or how much purity of the compound, or what kind of impurity might be there, how much impurity is there. All this can be correlated through, uh, of other than the characterization also through properties. And the arrangements of structure and properties themselves will also help to characterize them. If you see macroscopic properties, uh, we generally have so many thermodynamic properties and equally, all are equilibrium properties. Uh, macroscopic properties, we study through thermodynamics, chemical thermodynamics, or uh, what do you call bulk phase thermodynamics, equilibrium thermodynamics. Okay? Whereas microscopic properties, we go to quantum mechanics. Of course, there is another branch where statistical mechanics which combines both, but however, Today's my talk is restricted to macroscopic properties or the bulk properties, the properties as a whole. We need to understand this is the basic difference in the beginning itself. What three properties we are talking? That is property is due to what? Uh, it's completely different when you go for spectroscopy or for uh, imaging or imaging analysis or spectral analysis. And now here we are talking about the bulk analysis, macroscopy. And I think. The choice of the talks and the series is, is very well organized. So you go from very basic to the inherent and and then again you end with the thermal. That's how I like very much. So it's a famous statement from Italian scientist. Measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not. So today we all want good quality and quality is a quality you cannot and for comparison is only possible when you quantify. Okay. That's the challenge. That's the challenge in many fields and many places when you shortlist or when you look for how we can convert the quality. That's where the challenge. And what uh, Lord Kelvin says that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. That means it's there is in science, there is no scope of good or bad or, or excellent. It is always comparable. And where it is comparative means it should be some numbers or greater than and less than. So there is no absolute things which you can't compare or you can't express in numbers. So, but when you cannot measure it and you cannot express in numbers or at least in comparison, your knowledge is of major and answer. This was Lord Kelvin's famous statement. And uh, that's where the challenges are. And that's where the science is. The science is about truth. Nothing is wrong or right. This was also one of the famous uh, statement that here in science, at given circumstances and at given conditions, at the conditions of temperature or pressure or composition or whatever other things, purity, at given conditions, what you observe is the truth or close to the truth or close to the reality. Because you cannot achieve absolute reality because there are so many problems or the errors associated with it. At that, I will tell you in the fourth. If we are talking about bulk properties, if I ask my students, what kind of measurement you prefer? Experimental measurements you prefer to obtain, let's say, some property of water, let's say, uh, heat capacity of water, or whether you would like to model it computational, or would you derive from theories? What do you say is more close to the reality? Of course, reality is far from all three, three because each one of them has been associated with some or other kind of errors. So 
as we are going to minimize the errors more and more, we will go close and uh, closer and closer to the reality. So, not a same experimental or model or theory are absolutely right. Each one of them have they have their own problems, but combination this is called knowledge buying. Experiments together with theory and computer simulations are the pillar of science. We need all three. Because we cannot conduct all experiments. Experiments are the ultimate realities, at least if you compare among these three, because that shows the reality. And the theories are essential because that's the fundamental of the science from where, what could be the reasoning, why they are behaving so, why the properties are like that. And computer simulations are essential because we have a limitation of time, we have a limitation of human resources, we have a limitation of funds, we cannot do all the experiments. So, all three are essential, but when all three goes to the same answer or close to the one another answer, that's the ultimate. Today, if you submit any paper to any journal or a good journal of record, if you conclude something from one technique, it's very difficult to convince them. You always need to give supporting the other method or theoretical basis or computer simulation or correlation. So, multiple way we need recommendations even for a jobs. One recommendation or one degree is not enough. Again, recommendation letter of one or two. But we want to be doubly sure that yes, what we are saying to what we are doing is fine. That's where I told you in the beginning, whatever field, single field, your expert is not enough nowadays. You need to have a multiple ways of finding the same thing or through different collaboration and through unlike minds. You go out of the box and collaborate with engineers if you are a scientist or collaborate with scientists if you are an engineer and you go completely different field and ask their opinion how they are thinking in this direction. Or you, if you get an opportunity to sit in a different conference, you just sit there and see and think that what way this knowledge can be used in my research field that I can put it. Anyway, industrial requirement for thermodynamics and transport properties and what we are doing in academia, whether it is science departments or engineering department, it's different. Why academics are not working industry related problem or why industry is not believing our academic results and the publications, why they repeat again. So there is a communication what they want, what conditions they want of temperature, pressure, or other parameters, or presence of other things, we are not doing that. Most of the academicians do what is available on the bench, what kind of chemicals we do have, what kind of facility we have, because our collaborations are not that much extensive. Of course, scenarios are changing today. We are seeing that government itself is pushing industry and academia relations, and that's where the science is good. So, especially thermodynamic and transport properties are very, very essential and you need, you must know their um, uh, properties accurately because these are the key parameters, if not directly, directly derived properties in cost effective design and operation of various process and product design plants, be it in chemical or bio biochemical or pharmaceutical or other. So, these are the input parameters. Chemical engineers, they understand much better in, in Aspen or in Cosmo or in other, uh, what you call Mathematica. So, when you want to draw process and product design or the energy calculation or circular economy, this kind of things, how much energy is required, how, what is the viscosity change or transport energy required uh, liquid to transport from here to here or how much energy is required to increase one degree Celsius. All these parameters starts complex things start from the very simple things and these bulk properties are very very essential and this gives the feasibility of given process whether it is feasible or not because of their properties i'm not going that uh, uh, gives free energy and energy i'm not talking even from the bulk property itself you can say yes it is feasible or not or even when the transport properties have a major impact of the sizing equipment or how much the volume is changing with simple change in temperature or pressure. So that can 
fine or you have to optimize the plant size you cannot have very big and uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, what do you call the plant is or the size of the equipment is not fully utilized or you cannot have too small and then increase it may spill over and it may be accident you need to know exact amount and even conditions what could be the changes and even the material of uh, plants and all the what you call uh, equipment size all these things depends what kind of how much heat can be conducted whether it can hold or not and all this starts from understanding very simple bulk of how, how much accurate you need depending on which place or where where applications you are going to use and uh, the any equipment cost and other things will go high and high when you need better and better calibration and you need better and better accuracy. So, I research group last 10 15 years for myself also involved in measurement of varieties of of normal, uh, what you call organic fluids and their mixtures with. Uh, uh, salts or their mixture with uh, other liquids and ionic fluids or electrolytes. So, but mostly we work in bulk phase. So, all that experience what I have so far is very little on handling gases, gas phase materials or gases and solids, but most of them are on solution phase. But if you see, if I can divide all industrial process into three categories solid state bulk phase and the i believe most of the reactions and most of the things are at the bulk phase. whatever the reason might be maybe due to easy handling or easy heat dissipation or transport or handling so most of the things are at the bulk phase of course uh, solid state mixing is a problem transporting a problem you need to work at very high temperatures and gas phase probably the handling pressure is a problem you need more energies and the leakages are a problem and that's where probably the bulk phase are the most dominant so we were involved in various properties like volumetric properties transport properties refractive what we call acoustic properties thermal properties and various transport properties refractive properties and the derived properties so when you when you measure volume the volume alone may be important but when you measure volume as a function of temperature at constant pressure you can calculate possibility when you see when you calculate or when you measure the volume change as a function of pressure at constant temperature you can go for compressibility so what we have seen in last 15 years what I understood just by measuring seven or eight properties as a function of temperature, as a function of pressure is little bit difficult, but as a function of temperature itself, when you have five, six properties, this one, you can calculate more than 30 to 40 derived properties. Of course, it's a simple calculation, but you need to understand how many derived properties you can get. For example, Adiabatic compressibility you can calculate from speed of sound and the density. We go into the detail and this some constant and all this data and properties, including with phase equilibria, solid liquid and liquid equilibria. Today I'm not going to talk about much about that, but this data are the key and input parameters for process and product designs involving separations, heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid flow. To understand the uh, what do you call chemical and biochemical or pharmaceutical plants when it goes to the bulk stage. Of course, while a student working in the laboratory, he may not foresee this many things. He might be only worried about his next paper or a degree or a thesis. But that's where the gap is. Why industries are not believing our data because our data is more towards publication oriented or towards degree oriented or towards award reward oriented rather than the actual problem oriented. So, it would be win-win situation if a student 
or if a faculty and industry works collaboratively and the same thing done for you. Of course, in that kind of times, uh, application might be a problem, but we can go for a patent or a degree or whatever. There are so many ways to come out of that. And one more thing, the materials available in the market or open sources are N, especially organic solvents. And when you go from pure to binary and binary to ternary, the, the combinations are infinitive. And of course, we do not have that much time, do not have that many resources, and we do not have that much, uh, uh, what do you call, human resource and funds to do and measure all the properties of all kind of niche. That's where you develop predictive models, especially structure property correlations or group contribution methods. These are not really computational, but these are based on some data and then you data. So Unifag, Uniquark, or group contribution method, QSPR, QSAR, and these are uh, based on some experimental data and based on some empirical or semi-empirical equations we develop the models. Let me ask a simple question. We all know density is nothing but mass by volume. Very simple. If I ask a student, can you measure density of water? I give him and I give beaker prepared and balance. How much it cost to measure density of water? Beaker, 50 rupees, 100 rupees, prepared, 100 rupees. If it's a calibrated, two, 300 rupees. Or if you have a, that uh, uh, analytical or um, bio, biochemistry kind of things where you can have a resolution very high, but I'm not talking about simple, what you call class one, what we use in laboratory. Beaker, prepared, and a balance, simple balance. Not much. Maybe in 10,000 balance, and uh, all together in 15,000 or even less than that, you can measure density. Now, the questions arise that density of water, what you have used or measured using a beaker, pipette, and balance, what could be the what are the parameters might be affecting? So let's say I took 10 ml and uh, I measured, I took a beaker, I added 10 ml of water and I just measured it's 10 gram. And I simply put 10 gram by 10 ml or 10 gram by 10 cc. It's a 10, 10 cancel out. I'd say it's a one gram per centimeter. Now the question is, what could be the accuracy here? How much I can write? Is it 1 or 1.0, 1.00 or 1.00? How to obtain more and more reliable or more and more accurate data? Here, not so many things. You have only three things. One, mass. Two, volume. Third one, sample itself. So when you take three, Chances are high that you will get high accurate. So balance should be highly accurate. Volume measured should be highly accurate. And the, the water or the compound or the material itself should be highly pure. So that's the way you should start thinking. And the prepared you take instead of 0.1 ml accuracy, go for 0.01 or 0.001. Balance you go for my analytical balance and more accurate. And avoid all other deviations. What could be other conditions, by the way, other than these three? One is mass balance, two is volume prepared, three is the sample itself. Water. What could be the other one? Environmental condition. The temperature should not fluctuate in the laboratory, pressure should not fluctuate, or fluctuation should be as minimum as possible or when you may, uh, use the balance, analytical balance, which microgram accuracy, it should not be under the fan where fan is running at the fifth number. Or it should not be on the bench where the student put up uh, his uh, or her smartphone on vibrating and messages and message keep coming or the calls are coming and it's vibrating. There is no use of using that much accurate balance and not paying attention. So these are the Things one has to pay attention. Very small, small things. Very simple things. I usually ask my student, 
can you convert density of water one gram centimeter cube is equal to how many kilograms per day and all or not all most of the people think that okay kilogram means this should be less number and they come up with 10 raised to minus 3 actually it should be 10 raised to plus 3 because the denominator is also three times centimeter meter. anyway so this is the Anton Power website. I'm not promoting anybody, but these are the one of the well-known, uh, oldest and well-known company for digital density meters. And they have done so much advanced, how science has gone. They have hired all kinds of engineers, not only the electronic and electrical, or not only the chemical or materials, every is that's the amazing how you see a simple formula very simple formula so they have just taken oscillation period and a, and a volume and the unit then how mass has been changed and taken care of all other parameters including gravitational force including the material of the tube or all other things how accurate one can go so this is called vibrating tube density meter or oscillation period density meter another company metler i just put two companies because one should not feel that i am promoting i am to do with this this also uh, but this is not as old as uh, anton Parr. they are also coming up with new new uh, density meter you will be surprised to know i i, I do have this uh, dma 4500 m so here density you can measure less than few thousand rupees or even less than that okay here also you can measure same things the pro the change is the repeatability or the accuracy here you may measure one gram per centimeter cube or 0.1 gram per centimeter cube or 0.01 grams or two days or two days or if you is very high five balance and very high five pipette extra maybe three digits or four digits four digits is extremely difficult by balance models. people do with the dilatometer volume change there are various ways here you can get up to seventh digit that's what they claim but six digit you can publish with an accuracy this is reproduction or repetitive so Accordingly, cost also go high. Of course, different, different instruments will be different size. Anybody can guess, those who have used, they will be knowing, those who are not used, it. it's somewhere around 15 to 20 lakh. Not the highest model, the second or the third. So why this much cost has gone high? Of course, company wants to make profit. That is a different scenario. But the repeatability or the accuracy is extremely high, and for that they have to use all the compounds or the components certified. Calibration. When you want to buy a pipette without calibration and with calibration, you know how much price will be. Same with Peltier thermometer or other. Thing. So these are useful for only bulk phase, only liquid, uniform liquid. But if you have a suspended particle in a solid, no, it won't work. You need to have a uniform mixing. If particles are not settling down in the measurement time and they are in a equilibrium phase or they are in a uniform mixing phase, probably it's okay. But it's only for a pure solvents or their mixtures non-reactive because this is one of the requirement when you go for a binary and ternary mixture it should be non-electrolyte if it is electrolyte all the formulas will change all the requirement will change non-electrolyte non-reacting liquid mixtures and ternary liquid mixture measure and though it's showing syringe is very high but the enton power one will take this one will take around 2.5 ml or less than 2 ml and nothing will happen to the sample non-reacting you can reuse later on after so if you see the measuring range they claim zero but there is nothing called zero it's difficult maybe very close to air the air density onwards up to three and temperature range 
is uh, close to water melting temperature to close to water boiling temperature and pressure up to 10 bar. You see how one simple instrument can measure how accurate density. Repeatability is the seventh digit, temperature is the third digit, but you can claim accuracy at the seventh digit or the sixth. The so, as the data become more and more reliable, reproducible, and accurate, the price will go exponentially high. Now you may ask question, so why do we need this much accurate? What is the necessity of this much accuracy? Where is this will be useful? A good question. So the thing is, when you use any properties to calculate another property from that one, we call it derived properties. When you go from property to derived property, the chances are, not only chances are high, it is the error will propagate, error will go high. For example, if I say density is a mass by volume, the error in mass by error in volume will cancel out. Most more. In, in, in movie dialogue, we say something like Dushman ka Dushman dost hota hai. Or we say that enemy's enemy is friend. But here, in case of error, error pe error, error cancel nahi hota hai. Error dugna hota hai ya usse jada hota hai. So error will propagate. So errors will never cancel out. That we need to understand, and not only this density alone, the density will be used to calculate several derived properties in combination with other properties or in combination as a function of temperature, as a function of pressure, or all this. So, when you have double derived, derived properties, double derived properties, and properties from there, or you correlate and get derived parameters that you want more and more accurate for the process and product design original one will be much more. I believe in the market across the globe, there is no other instrument can measure density much better than this one, other than this Anton Bar, what I spoke, the seventh digit. That's a revolution and is very recent, not, seven, not very old. The technique is very simple. You have a U-shaped tube. Okay? You have a Peltier here to measure temperature and uh, additional volume will not be considered here so here kind of a something only volume from here to here considered volume you know and you make it oscillation at non frequency so these are the apparatus constants uh, this may depending on uh, temperature or viscosity or non viscosity of the sample also matters here so you are measuring density if viscosity high or viscosity low that also will affect Oscillation because of their bulkiness. So, uh, instrument apparatus that might be due to the materials of this U-shaped shape polymer made up of, or gravitation force, and all the correct parameters they will put it. And this is a simple equation where density can be A into tau square, that is the oscillation period square, plus B. The two coefficient, it's a linear. So they do plot it for various. Uh, let's say air, water, and all these things. Non density, non oscillation periods measure one and plot y is equal to mx plus c, like uh, tau square versus uh, rho, and you get a and b parameters. And you go more and more accurate inbuilt parameter, they will not provide that as, but it's fine. This is the same thing. So these oscillations are various kinds of oscillations are called, but most of them are y shape oscillations. They are here. It is fixed. This is filled with your uh, sample 2 to 2.5 mm, and you have a temperature filter very much nearby. And this oscillation and at uh, constant frequency, how much is calculating? Then you use this formula: rho is equal to tau square or q square, and this two are parameters. And these are measured by, for the so many. A references and then you will be find out the q is a quotient of period of oscillation of this youtube divided by the period of oscillation for the reference the reference might be a uh, vacuum or air or uh, or a water but they do with several one and uh, then derive this formula and then they'll give you a and b so of course 
there are other density meter which have oscillation type of x and w but i have not come across so many most of them are with this uh, y shape and this is brilliant uh, image of this one you see this is a uh, uh, this is here it is a glass but this is a special kind of polymeric materials uh, and then you have a temperature sensor across and uh, volume is a fixed because it will be considered from here to here you need not to close because if you close what happened the temperature change the volume change will not be inside so it will build pressure unless you are working on as a function of pressure and then with this oscillation so what is funda here the oscillation is proportional to the mass thing and then they come up with such a nice way of calculation calibration I hope I have some time to show this video and it would be worth watching how science grows. I'm not promoting them. Just see how the science has grown from where to where. This is all about in last 30 to 40 years, not beyond that. I myself used in my PhD DMA, what is a basic model where we, we take the oscillation period and take A and B parameter and calculate in Excel or with the calculator and and today how much it has been changed in just 20 to 25. But that's why it is not audible. Yeah. If it, it is not audible. Sorry. It is not audible. Your video. video is not audible. Oh, video is not audible? No, sir. When I speak, volume comes yeah. and I can listen from here. So it should go, no? I don't know. But there is no sound. Wait, wait. Let me go to YouTube and then see. I thought if I could listen, that means volume is coming, that is equivalent to I'm talking. Well, I don't know, but listeners are not able to listen. What about this? So still, it is not audible. Okay, then leave it. Right. But my voice is coming. Yeah, perfectly. Your voice is perfectly audible and everything. It's surprising. Something new I learned today. <laughs> so probably it is a speaker, but not the mic. The speaker's volume is different and mic volume is different. Yeah. So you, you can unplug the speaker, you unplug that microphone if you have. No, it's okay. I think it will uh, is a waste of time. It, if something goes wrong, then remaining talk will go bad. Let, let, okay, but you can see my screen, no? You can yes, see yes. my screen. Yes, yes, okay. completely. Let, let's see without volume how it uh, you can understand you can for instance, seconds, not much. Yes. Yeah. So, this professor is a physics person who wanted to measure precise density. This is the first one. You will be happy to know I used this also in South Africa. Uh, Nirmala Dean, the lab. This is an Austria based company. Australia, but we do have it all over the world. They started in 1977. This is the first model, 1981. So in filling check, what we have to worry is air bubble is not trapped. Liquid should be complete. So 
while passing this 2.5 ml, you have to be extremely careful that no dissolved gases are there and no air bubbles are coming. So why why oscillating light? And it takes triplicate results. This is the highest precision of density anybody has ever put, including viscosity correction and the bubble check correction. Even if it is a dissolved gas is there, it will detect, tell that, remove the gas. If you want to have a gas, then you say, yes, please go ahead. So it's a pulse excitation method and a combination of uh, engineering and mastery and so on. You see in just 30 years or 25 years, from where to where the science has grown or the technology has gone. Not in this property, all other properties are like that. Okay? And as I told you earlier, these properties are very, very essential to calculate several derived properties and that's where it is. And uh, similarly, we know in uh, BSC or 12th standard, we start with Oswald viscometer, we call single arm viscometer. Then you go to Ubelhold viscometer where you have a double arm viscometer. So the, what do you call, the amount of the sample you have taken will not affect the flow because of the gravitational force. That itself, we were very happy that from Oswald, we came to Ubelhold viscometer. And today, we measure through rolling ball viscometer or the time taken or the proportionally constant, very, very high accurate, even less than 0.1 centipoise of uh, viscosity equation. And uh, this is the one of the Indian companies, so I put it, Mittal Enterprise in Delhi. They are in India very much famous, not only in India, but many Asian countries like uh, uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and the nearby Israel or other, other countries. There are many countries using this one. But in India, predominantly, uh, when I was a PhD student, this was the only one uh, speed of sound instrument, especially physics people, they say ultrasonic velocity or chemistry people say speed of sound. But this is at a frequency, it's a frequency. So you have a, what you call, frequency generator quartz crystal at the bottom. And uh, known frequency continuously will come, usually 2 megahertz one. And the simple formula is velocity is equal to wavelength into frequency. And then you just check, now they become digital. Earlier it was, you need to see here the current stage you need to bring from left to right. We used to count 10 cycle and then divide it by 10. So the accuracy will go high. It's a very simple, very unique one. And uh, it's only, only the fundamental thing is the quartz crystal should continuously have the same frequency and then wavelength can be you can just exit or make it half or the given frequency. Very simple and uh, reliable but nowadays there are so many sophisticated instruments coming but same principle. And the refractive index as I told you it's very simple to measure. Snell's law we know. Uh, how the lab, but we measure through sodium D line or the light with that we need to specify and uh, we need to understand today you can calculate with uh, refractive index measure in the fourth decimal or the fifth decimal. Abbe viscometer are there and there are Anton Parr viscometers are there. So uh, the technology has developed so much, but still we need to understand some general policies which I will go through quickly. And these are the few instruments I used in uh, 
my laboratory and my collaborators laboratory you see this uh, refractometer also you have now digital and uh, other transport property i didn't put much so we have contributed to the nist iupac database high accurate thermodynamic data of pure ionic liquids and their mixtures with solvents anyway that is not the concern now i will talk little bit maybe 10 15 minutes 10 minutes 10 minutes about uh, what are the challenges we face in high end this kind of equipments and what are the uh, requirement one should focus so any instrument when you have high fi high end equipment which is few lakhs or above that first prerequisites are you need to understand the theory based on that on what principle they are using and then you need to attend the workshop by the uh, instrument supplier or when they uh, install or you speak with the technician or the scientific officer if if you get first hand experience it's good otherwise you watch them doing so you understand what kind of uh, challenges are associated how you prepare a sample how you handle it how you take it how you clean it how you get the data how you calibrate it these are the most essential parts of when you use any sophisticated otherwise there is no use just you submit sample and technician or the scientific officer gives you never understand the requirement so especially apart from this uh, understanding the theory and the first hand uh, uh, experience and the installation understanding most crucial parts are sample preparation what kind of sample you need for your instrument what how much amount is enough you can't take too less or you can't bombard too much sometimes we think that if we add more sample the results will be better no so we need to understand the optimization and if dilution is required how much dilution is required you need to understand and you should have a, some preliminary knowledge about the functional group associated elemental analysis or while measuring these properties as a function of temperature or pressure some uh, what you call accidents or the some poisonous gas or some unforeseen reaction may happen or not especially when you work on open atmosphere will it take nitrogen or oxygen or other gases or dissolved one or will it take moisture or will affect the property especially the transport property for example viscosity and the conductivity if you keep it open in atmosphere if you absorb moisture transport properties affects a lot you will not have correct results so you need to understand the challenges associated one purity of the sample is most important one more whatever the sophisticated your instrument might be if compound itself the itself is not pure how you will get it so purity calibration how often you should calibrate it calibration and the data analysis once you get the data how you will read it how you will analyze this and how many varieties of the errors are associated and how you will uh, analyze that errors or when your instrument is not in use how to maintain how to switch on how much time it should take to thermal equilibrium or how much how to maintain when you are not using for one month or two months do we need to uh, put it in uh, some other solvent or other conditions these things are very very essential and some of the high-end equipments take uh for example you need to have a chiller or a heater a circulatory bath or you need to have a varieties of the gases or the liquid nitrogen so what kind of consumable associated and what kind of errors associated you also keep in mind and i will go through quickly some slides on error analysis of these bulk properties remember measurements invariably involve errors and uncertainty we can only hope to minimize the error and estimate their size and the acceptable accuracy. There is nothing called ultimate truth or the 100% accurate. Not possible. Because this involved various kind of errors might be due to instruments or might be due to calibrations or the standard materials you use, the reference materials you use or human errors. Even if I don't count human errors, and uh, instrument errors and the purity of the sample still other kind of standardization method or the instrument materials used all this kind of thing 
So, but errors can be either random or systematic. So, we'll just go through quickly. And that's where we try to replicate the results. So, which are exactly at the same condition you do. And you see same, same instruments, same compound, same person, same day, same condition, again doing second time. If you repeat, it's called replicate. Or two times you do triplicate. And the precision accuracy, you know, we study from uh, uh, nine standard onwards. If this uh, image is very popular, what we want, high accurate and high precision. And where the challenge is, where precision is high, but not accurate. In this kind of case, it's a misleading. We think that I repeated three times and I got same results because that means your results are precise, but we don't know whether they are accurate. And this, this kind of case where your results are uh, accurate, but you don't know each time I re, uh, do, results are giving a little bit error. So one has to be very careful in both these cases. And we want accuracy also high, but we need precision also high. And as I told you, the random errors and uh, systematic errors. So systematic errors are quite challenging, but you can remove. Random errors we can minimize, but you need to understand very carefully these kind of errors and the gross errors are due to all these things, all the kind of random, systematic and everything is in. So, instrumenter errors can come under systematic error because you have not calibrated, all data will have exactly same error. So, do you think that all data are matching each other or your method itself is wrong? Because you are repeating same method, you think that, okay, every time you are getting same method or the personal error or human, every time you do same mistake, you think it's a 12 ml, but you are adding 10 ml. So these kind of errors are systematic error. It is difficult to remove because you don't identify error is there, especially when the same person is doing. That's why you need to do other person or sometime other day. And the constant errors are independent of the size of the sample and the proportional errors are increase or decrease with this. And errors are good when you have a larger sample size. But proportional error will help you what is happening with the size. You increase the size, error will increase. So there are methods to understand and detect. First thing, you have to have a standard samples which has been already standardized by other things and the company or the instrument speaker or this, they will tell these are the standardized material and you analyze them. Or you do independent analysis, not one day, different day, not one person, different person or not one method, different. Methods. And you should have calibration curves or the blank determination or you check with the different sample size if it is possible. And this way you can understand the systematic errors. And as I told you, Error propagation, uh, this was, I was giving multiplication of the division. So if your Y is a property, which is the combination of three properties, A, B, and C, the propagation of error in Y, that is S, Y, standard division is Y, is the square root of all these. Whether it is summation or subtraction, all will add up. Similarly, whether it is a multiplication or division, this is the part. So we need to understand, it's a simple formula, but we need to understand how to calculate this error associated, what is the precision, what is accuracy, how you can go through, and what Excel is giving, how you refine this data. And this is one of the best website from National Institute of Standard and Technology, NIST Thermodynamic Research Center, for all kinds of varieties of the materials, how Thermodynamic Center help you to understand this kind of data and errors and they have a one database it is called thermolink especially for solutions not only pure uh, liquids but their binary and ternary mixture how properties will change and you can get this free of charge the data or the reference reference is needed not the data the reference you will get who has been studied earlier and many journals now asking it is a compulsory to build this thermolid, all these thermodynamic journals, Journal of Molecular Liquids, Thermochemical Acta, Food Facility, Journal of Chemical Thermodynamics, Solution, Journal of Solution Chemistry, 
International Journal of Thermophysics or Journal of Chemical and Engineering Data. This data journals are asking this date and this is free of charge. This will help you to understand how errors are associated and how they have calculated same property with different. Like for example, speed of sound, there are sophisticated instruments much more than and very precise even for thermal conductivity or even for a viscosity. So one has to go into the depth involved in the science, but I have gone just peripheral, just to give an, a glimpse of an idea how simple bulk properties can be helpful and what kind of things. I believe in the next decade or so, we will face varieties of the problems associated with the energy, water, food or health. And given the magnitude of this challenge, when we want to go into the laboratory scale, to the R&D scale, to the bulk scale, to the pilot scale, to the industrial scale, the accurate data on thermodynamic and thermophysical properties, bulk properties, whether through experiment or correlation or computation are required. And this will certainly play a key role. And this will be a good future for people working on molecular thermodynamics. And Thank you. And these are the, my research group and uh, email ID grds at iitm.in.